Father, we just, Lord, we are longing for the day that we will see you face to face and worship you. And Lord, I am so thankful for everything that you've done for me. I am longing for that day. And Father, I just ask that as we go through your word today, that you would visit us. I just ask this in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. All right, uh, before we go, is the sound still distorted for the Zoom deep people? Have we got thumbs up, thumbs down. Can they hear me clearly? Is it clear? How's that? It's getting better? We're trying a variety of different things. These are changing times technologically, and we are trying to adapt. It is clear now. Yes. Score. Score for one, one for mankind over the machine. All right. You know, we've, we've made lots of movies about these sorts of times, you know. Uh, I just, the Terminator movies keep coming back. And back, and back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's my side, my side. <laughs> like, what sort of days are we living in? And this is real interesting because as we go through Revelation, it's, there's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of things that we just see. It's like, what sort of days do we have in store for us? And Andre, I can absolutely feel your pain of hearing yourself bouncing off of that wall and that wall and that wall before you actually hear it coming out of your mouth. It's very, uh, for those of you who, you might see Andre every once in a while kind of look around his shoulder, it's because he's hearing himself come from the other direction and he's, yeah, it's, you know, we're going to be so thankful going into the vision uh, building and to have actual fallback speakers and uh, it'll be, it'll be a, a, a great blessing and uh, we are very much looking forward to it. Amen. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold menorot. And in the midst of the menorot, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe down to his feet, with a gold belt wrapped around his chest. His head and his hair were like wool white like the snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of rushing waters. And his, in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came forth a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining at full strength. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the one who, were, who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever. Moreover, I hold the keys of death and Sheol. Therefore, write down what you have seen, what is and what, what will happen after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden men wrote, the seven stars are the angels of Messiah's seven communities, and the seven gold menorot are the seven communities. Amen. You know, I long for the day that I will get to see Yeshua face to face. As I read this passage, I really do get a glimpse of what that might be like, what he will look like. And I wonder to myself whether or not my response is going to be very similar to that of John's. Uh, I think it probably will, but it will be worth it to have those eyes of fire that can pierce right through me to see me for everything that I am and to love me still. It will be worth everything. I long for that day. Rav Shaul wrote this in Romans chapter 8. He says, For I consider the sufferings of this present age not worthy to be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation eagerly awaits the revealing, or the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of the one who subjected it. In the hope that creation itself will also be set free from bondage to decay into glorious freedom 
the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that the whole of creation groans together and suffers birth pains until now. And not only creation, but even ourselves. We ourselves, who had the first fruits of the Ruach, we groan inwardly, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. Just a brief background in case anybody's joining in uh, as we're studying the book of Revelation, in particular online. Uh, we are going through the book of Revelation. John, the son of Zebedee, uh, one of the disciples of Yeshua, was in exile on the Isle of Patmos uh, because he was preaching the word of Yeshua. And because he was teaching people to not worship the emperor. Last week we began really with the prophetic background and we talked a bit about uh, specifically Daniel and Zechariah giving two different passages that, that form a good deal of the foundation for what we will read. This week we will continue and we will talk about the revelation of the Son of Man, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Some of the descriptions that we see here are very similar to descriptions we see of angelic beings throughout the scriptures. So when we, we look at these uh, descriptions that John is giving, and uh, you know, we see some that relate very much to angels that we see in scripture, and then others, these are attributes that are only given to Adonai, they're only given to God. I was reading through one of the commentaries and they wanted to look at all of the different, the seven different descriptions of Yeshua and they're trying to give symbolic meanings for every single one. But I don't think that's how John saw it. I think he was just simply explaining what he saw. It's true that there are some things that are difficult to comprehend, difficult to explain, but he was doing his best, using the, the, uh, the language he had to explain and express exactly what he saw. We will always be limited when we look at the Almighty God. I was in a, in a conversation recently and, and talking to someone and they, they, were, they were really uh, complaining about, about how, how complicated the oneness or the tri-unity, the unity, the complex unity of God really is. Why does it have to be so complex? Wouldn't it be simpler if God was just one and one only? There's a word in Hebrew for that, that's Yahid. What's interesting is that's not the word that's used to describe the oneness of God. The word is Echad. Echad can also talk to something that is complex in its unity, such as one cluster of graves or one tabernacle made of many parts. Yeshua came to John and he allowed John to see himself in all of his glory. John describes it in multiple ways, the brilliance of Yeshua's countenance. He uses a, a, whole, a whole bunch of different ways of looking at, you know, just the brightness of Yeshua's person. John would later write in, in 1 John, the letter 1 John, that God is light. And in Him there is no darkness at all. You know, this is not the first time that John had actually seen Yeshua like this. He was one of the three, three disciples who went up onto that high mountain. And they saw Yeshua in His glory. It says that He was transfigured. Yeshua was transfigured before them. And the description that that is given there in Matthew is that they saw his face shine like the sun and his clothes become white as the light. You know, John had fallen down that time as well. Uh, Peter was also there and James was also there. But they were overwhelmed by the glory of Adonai, just as John was overwhelmed here. Now let's look at these verses closely. Verse 13. In verse 13 it says, In the midst of the seven menorot, 
I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe down to his feet with a golden belt wrapped around his chest. Now this is an interesting description there. Uh, white in, in the ancient times was the color of kings because it was so expensive to get clothes actually white. And for all of you ladies and men who do the laundry, I must include men in that. We're training our sons well. Um, but for all of us, when you get a stain in white, it is a pain in the rear to get out. You have to bleach it and soak it and, and really wash it to make it white. And I, I find it interesting that this is the color of kings, but it is also the color of the priests. When the Lord said this is what the priests must wear, they must wear a white tunic down to their ankles. So here we see a description of the clothes that not only the kings wore, but also the priests. Now gold, of course, is a, a color of kings. I mean, it was, you know, a golden sash around, either around his chest this way or, or this way. And we know that many of the depictions of the Roman emperors had a sash over, this, or over their shoulders. But we know that the high priest also had a multicolored sash that had gold woven into it, wrapped around them as well. And so here we see Yeshua wearing clothes that would be synonymous with both a kingly role and a priestly role. This is also very similar to the description that Daniel gives in Daniel chapter 10. Go to the next slide. I'm just going to jump over to Daniel chapter 10 starting at verse 4. I can read it from up there, but... I'm, I'm gonna. I, you know, one of the things that uh, somebody once taught me about preaching, he says, never be afraid to look up the verse in your Bible because everybody else should be looking it up. It gives them time also to, to uh, look it up themselves and also to digest what's just been said. So Daniel chapter 10, starting at verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, while I was beside the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man dressed in a linen, with a belt of fine gold from Urphaz around his waist. His body was like yellow jasper, his face like a flash of lightning, his eyes like fiery torches, his arms and his feet like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the roar of a multitude. I mean, we just read Revelation, we just read that passage, and you're like, was John seeing a pre-incarnate Yeshua? A pre-incarnate Messiah? It's possible. It's possible with Daniel, sorry. Daniel was. That, that was posting kind of, my, thank you. But was Daniel also seeing that? Was Daniel seeing Yeshua in his glory? It's possible. It doesn't have to be. It could simply be that when angelic beings are in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, and when divine, when that is the is a, an expression of the, the author is trying to write down the just what the glory of God looked like. You know, there's a description of Moses' face shining because he had simply been in the presence of God for 40 days. And it says that Moses put a veil over his face because the glory was fading. And he didn't want to show that it was fading. But here we see this description of this, this, uh, this heavenly being that Daniel sees. And the description is very similar to what John describes in Revelation. Regardless of whether or not Daniel saw the Son of Man in this vision in chapter 10, we see that the author of Hebrews actually gives another description. If you want to go over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and we'll start at first word. Actually, I think I have verse 3. We'll start at verse 3. The sun is the radiance of his glory and the imprint of his being, upholding all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thus he has become far above the angels 
as the name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Yes, it's true that the description of Yeshua is very similar to other angelic beings. And I know that some of those, some of the descriptions that we'll go through, yes, they're, they're exactly the same. But there are also some descriptions that are only ever attributed to the Lord God Almighty. Let's go to, back to Revelation, verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. His head and his hair were white like wool, white like the snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. This description of the hair being white as wool is a, is a description that is only ever attributed to the Lord God Almighty. We read this passage in, in uh, Daniel chapter 7 last week, where it talked about the Ancient of Days, and it said the hair of his head was white like wool. We also see the description of the voice sounding like the, the tumultuous waters, or many waters, or the rushing of waters. This is a description that is used multiple times by multiple prophets to describe the sound of God's voice. Ezekiel talks of this in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 43. Ezekiel heard this voice. When Adonai spoke, it was like the rushing of waters. It was that roar of, of uh, for those of you who've never heard or been at Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls or a, a massive waterfall where the very ground shakes because of the sound of that water. That's the sound that these people heard. We see that these things, are, that Yeshua is similar to angels, but he's definitely no less than angels. In fact, he is greater. He, he has these attributes that are attributed only to the Lord God Almighty. The point of Yeshua's fiery eyes, his white hair, and his bronze feet is that he was radiating the very glory of God. He was radiating light and fire. If you look at the, the descriptions of Adonai throughout the scriptures, you'll see that that is very synonymous with when God shows up. I mean, think about the burning bush that burned and yet was not consumed. Verse 16. In his right hand he had seven stars, but out of his mouth came forth a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining at its full strength. This attribute of a sword coming out of the mouth is it's, um, somewhat difficult to explain or, or describe. It's, it's one of those attributes that we, we look at it and say, well, okay, if he's seeing something, what is he actually seeing? Is this a physical sword or what's going on? You know, the author in Hebrews chapter 4 says this, that the word of God is living and active and is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is piercing, it pierces through to a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Rav Shaul actually wrote to the, uh, the congregation in Ephesus, one of, the, one of the recipients of the book of Revelation. He wrote to them, that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So the, the audience already understood this in a very real terms. When John is talking about this sword that's coming out of his mouth, that makes sense. This is the Word of God in the flesh, speaking the Word of God. But there's a little bit more to this. You see, there were many different uh, Roman generals, Roman uh, emperors, uh, even uh, Greek and Roman deities that were depicted carrying and holding a sword, a weapon of war. But there's also something more than just that. You see, this is actually a reference back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5.
This is an incredible passage. It starts out saying, Then a shoot will come forth out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will bear fruit out of its roots. The Ruach of Adonai will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and insight, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Adonai. His delight will be in the fear of Adonai. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the poor of the land. He will strike the land with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt around his loins, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. I mean, listen to this passage. This is a passage that is so messianic. I mean, it talks about the son of David, the stem of Jesse, the Messiah, the king of kings. And he says that he's going to come and strike the land with the rod of his mouth. That his words will be the judgment that brings death to the enemies. We will actually see this even more talked about in Revelation as we go through and we see Yeshua talking and, and really his words have power. But these are the very words that created the world. The, world, the words that called the world into existence. We need to remember that Yeshua is the word of God in the flesh. And he will be the one who wields the sword of Adonai's judgment. He will be the judge of all the earth. Revelation verse 1, verses 17 and 18. You know, after John fell down, Yeshua encouraged him not to be afraid. Yeshua makes three powerful declarations about himself. He says, I am the first and the last, number one. Number two, I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forevermore. And number three, I hold the keys of death and Sheol. You know, this first statement about being the first and the last is very similar to the, the statement we read last week about being the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We discussed that and we talked about how that comes from Isaiah chapter 41, 44, and 48. And in those three places, it says, the Lord God is speaking, and he says, I am the first and the last, says the Lord God Almighty. Adonai Elohim Sabaot, the Lord God of armies, of heaven's armies. So after di directly proclaiming to be the voice of Adonai, one with Adonai, then he provides a distinction. He says, I'm the one who was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Adonai speaks through Isaiah and he says this. He says this, he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Yeshua then states something that would be very encouraging to the audience that was listening, to those who were being persecuted. He says, I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Yeshua is the one who controls death and the grave. Hades was the Greek word for a, a Greek deity. It was the Greek word that ended up being synonymous with the place of Hades that the god Hades ruled over. But it became translated as hell. Sheol, Sheol is uh, the, the Hebrew equivalents. It's the place of the dead. But in this, Yeshua is saying, I'm the one who has authority over death and the grave. You know, he's speaking to, to people who, who were about to go through persecution or already were going through persecution at the hands of Domitian. And the emperor Domitian claimed to be God or to be a God. He claimed to be a God and he demanded worship. Yet Domitian could take 
the lives of these believers. But there's one thing he couldn't do. He couldn't give them back their lives after they were dead. He had no power to give life back. And what Yeshua is saying here is not only do I have power to take life, I have power to restore life. I am the one who controls when you die and when you go to the grave. Death does not come to us by accident. When it comes, it only comes as the Lord permits, as our loving Savior, Savior permits it. Yeshua is the only one so far to rise from the dead and never to die again. He is victorious over death and he has promised us eternal life when we trust in him. Let's close with uh, verses 19 and 20. There are two final thoughts that I want to bring out from these two verses. Yeshua goes in, and I just want to read it. It says, therefore, write these things down, what you have seen, what is, and what will happen after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden men wrote, the seven stars are the angels of Messiah's seven communities, and the seven men wrote are the seven communities. John writes, or of what Yeshua says, Yeshua tells him, he says, some of what you see is for now, and some of what you see is in the future. Well, there you go. There's our, there's our uh, a good, good starting point for us for the Re book of Revelation. Some of it was directly applicable to the audience that was listening to it. But you know, just as every other scripture, the principles that Yeshua speaks to every single one of these congregations are just as applicable today. There might be some nuances that, are, that were very specific to that congregation who heard it. But we can definitely apply those principles. And there are some things that we also have to look forward to. We are looking forward to the coming of Yeshua. The ruling and reigning of Yeshua over the world systems. Over the world. Through all of this book of Revelation. Yeshua is genuinely in charge of history. Just like Ashley Crane mentioned when he spoke, he, Yeshua, is the one who opens the seals. He is the one who decides when the judgments happen. He is the one who decides when the Antichrist will rise. He is the one who causes nations and empires to rise and fall. He is in charge of our history, our heritage, our present situation, and our destiny. Finally, Yeshua provides an interpretation for the seven stars in His hand and for the seven golden menorah, menorot, that were standing around Him. And there's something interesting about this that I want you to pick up. Yes, He says, look, the stars are the angels of the congregations. Yes, we could, we could simplify that and say messengers, the angel meant messenger, but I think that they literally are angels. The God stations angels over us as a community, guardian angels. And then he says the seven golden menorah were the seven congregations, you know, bringing light to the world. We are called to be the light of the world, to reflect the glory of God, just as Yeshua did. But there's something else that I want to point out. Jesus is more than able to give the interpretation of the book of Revelation. Joseph said to Pharaoh back in Genesis chapter 40, 41. Pharaoh brought him up, gave him a dream and says, okay, I want you to interpret. And Joseph says this. He says, it's not within me. God will answer with shalom for Pharaoh. Interpretations of dreams and visions come from God. Yeshua will provide the ultimate interpretation for the book of Revelation. Now, there is a longing in my heart to really to tell you what Yeshua looks like from personal experience, but I can't. I also am longing for that day when I will see Him face to face. To hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
I long for that day. I long for that day when I can say just like Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye has seen you. Abba Father, I just ask, I pray, I long, Lord, I want to see you. Lord, and I, I, Lord, when we talk of revival, when we talk about the coming of your presence, Lord, we are talking about you showing up and revealing yourself. Lord, that's exactly what we're talking about. Nothing more, nothing less. Lord, we long for you and for your presence. Lord, it is in your presence that there is fullness of joy. Lord, it is at your right hand that there are pleasures forevermore. Lord, it is in you that we can find satisfaction and find fulfillment. And Father, it is in you that we can feel complete and total acceptance, complete love. And Lord, it is in you, Lord, that we have our hope. Lord, our trust is in you. And we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face, when we will look upon you and we will see the nail prints in your hands and the wound in your side for the pain that you paid for us. Abba Father, have mercy on us. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just want, actually, I want to go straight into um, into prayer. If there is anybody who who is uh, who has not given their life to the Lord, I want to give you this opportunity to do so. Because there's always a first step. The scripture says, you must believe that God is and, and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And this is what we, this is what we're doing. We are diligently seeking His face. But if you have not even made that first step, I want to encourage you right now just to pray with me. And uh, just say, Father God, forgive me. I am a sinner. And I desperately need your forgiveness. Father God, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that he was crucified for me, that he died for my sins and paid the payment that I could not pay. And I choose to put my trust in him, in Yeshua, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. 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 Now I just want to open up. If there's anyone that, uh, I know this is a generic, I think maybe we'll just all stand at this time. But we're just going to ask the Lord for more of God's presence. I think if there's anyone who would just, uh, yeah, specifically want more of God's presence, I think this is a good time. I think, like, in, in this place, I'm pretty sure that well, that's pretty much like 99.999%. I think the point point one percent is already left. Yes, did you have something? Oh, uh, just pursuant to um, Irwin's prophetic word about refreshing. Oh. I know that I know that I know there's a couple of people here today who need that refreshing. And I'm thinking of the psalmist when he says, "He restores my soul and leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake." And in another place, the psalmist says. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. And this, if I may, in this family group where it's not too embarrassed, but I was wondering if we could call up and pray for my brother Frank, who's come on today for yep. um, the joy of salvation and a breakthrough in his particular family situation. Yes, and I was wondering if we could also pray for my dear sister. Is it Myra? I was wondering if we could pray the same for you, sister, in, in your family and domestic situation for a breakthrough, and especially for the words that have been spoken in your household. You're married, aren't you? In that situation, I don't want to expose you any further than that, but just, is that sort of something happening in that situation? Yeah, I'd really like to, some of the girls to gather around you and just... Yeah. Part. So as we gather around uh, both of these people, Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. 